And we're going to look at probably one of the top five prophetic chapters in all of the Bible. So it's pretty exciting tonight. So hopefully that will come across as we look at this magnificent chapter in Daniel chapter 7. And when we look at this chapter, it's so important because it really is the commencement of a new section in the book. Um, in the first six chapters, we've got this contest of wills where the sovereignty of God um, is seen in our affairs. And from chapters 7 through to 12 is now the contest for the world where we see the sovereignty of God in world affairs. And I'm not going to go through all those details, um, but it certainly it starts off a very new section in this book where it's written in the first person. Uh, it's very prophetical rather than biographical. Um, um, contrast to the five chapters of Syriac and one chapter of Hebrew in the first section, now that reverses with one chapter of Syriac here in chapter 7 and then the rest in Hebrew. Um, what's interesting about those Syriac chapters, though, is this really interesting dynamic between them where they're, they're paralleled uh, and contrasted through the section. Um, and, of course, you've got the great comparison between Daniel chapter 2 with, Dan with uh, Nebuchadnezzar's image and you've got Daniel's chapter 7 which is God's view of that same kingdom of men, not as a great powerful image of men, but as what he sees them, the nation's beasts. And it all pivots around that little section in chapters, chapter 4, verses 34 to 37, where Nebuchadnezzar has been made a beast that he might learn to give honour and glory to the God of heaven who rules and so it's so significant that that is the pivot point of those chapters, which end with chapter 7, where we see God's view of the kingdom of men. They are beasts and need to submit to his will. And so while Nebuchadnezzar saw that image in chapter 2, as we saw of the head of gold of Babylon, the arms and the chest of Persia, the brazen uh, loins and thighs of Greece, and then the iron legs of Rome, what we now see in chapter 7 is the comparable animals, these beasts, for those dominions. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Um, by way of introduction, it's important to understand that the focus, although it mentions Babylon and Persia and Greece, the real focus of this chapter is, is the Roman Empire, which was split into two. You can see there one, one leg in the west was based in Rome, one leg in the east was based in Constantinople. And the focus of chapter 7 is really this, this western part of Rome, whereas chapter 8, which we'll be looking at next class, is in that um, eastern section of Rome. So when we look at chapter 7, it's broken up into two halves, parallel halves. In verses 1 to 16, we've got the vision, and in verses 17 to 28. And as I've mentioned, it focuses on that judgment on Western Rome, and particularly the little horn of uh, this fourth beast. We've got in verses 1 to 8, the vision of the four beasts, and then in verses 17 to 18, we're given the meaning of the four beasts. In verses 9 to 14, we're given the judgments that come upon the fourth beast. And in verses 19 to 27, the expansion of meaning about that fourth beast. In verses 15 to 16, we've got the, the effect it has on Daniel, how he was troubled. And then again at the end of uh, chapter 7 in verse 28, Daniel's troubled again. So Daniel is intimately involved in this message and I want you to get involved with it tonight and, and to feel the power of this message even as Daniel felt it. So let's have a look in verse 1 of chapter 7 of Daniel. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Um, it's interesting that Belshazzar was only known from the prophet of Daniel uh, and one other um, document until about 1854. And then references were found to him in the Babylonian cuneiform inscriptions. He was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, who we know well, the son of Nabonidus. And when Nabonidus went uh, away, um, he headed up to, uh, um, up to Timah in his sixth year. Then Belshazzar took the throne. So this is BC 550. We can, we can date it from that message. And in that year, Daniel sees in verse 2, in my vision by night. This is a symbol of the night of Gentile darkness. This is the powers that are going to have a great influence on Daniel's people, the people of Israel. 
And in this seventh chapter, we see the four amazing beasts. Can you imagine being Daniel? You're sleeping. You know what it's like. You're having a nice rest. You might even be having a very pleasant dream. And then suddenly this dream changes and you get all confused and it's all distressing. And can you imagine seeing these animals? You know, you see this lion and then it's suddenly sprouting wings. That's, that's probably not too confusing. Daniel would have seen those. Uh, on many of the buildings when he was in Babylon, of course. He sees this bear with his three ribs. He sees this, this, this leopard, but it's not just an ordinary leopard. He's got four heads and four wings. That's, that's pretty startling. But then comes this fourth terrible beast, and it's terrifying. He is completely disturbed by this one. W what an amazing vision. That's why he come over to Hosea for a minute in chapter 13. Because sometimes we might wonder, you know, why, why is it that so much of the world's history is missed out of the Bible? You know, we don't read about China. We don't actually read a lot about the United States, for example. When it comes to Bible prophecy, the important thing to understand is that God is interested in his people, Israel. And it's only in as much as the nations are involved with Israel that they're described in the scriptures. So if we have a look in Hosea chapter 13... We pick up the record um, in verse 6 that according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they have begotten me. So Israel turned away from their God. Therefore, he brings nations against them. Look at the nations in verse 7. He brings upon them the lion, Babylon. He brings upon them the leopard, Greece. In verse 8, I'll meet them as a bear. He worked through the Persians. And that bear that's bereaved of its whelps will rend the call of their heart. And there will I devour them like a lion. And the wild beast, the wild animal, shall tear them, that fourth great unnamed beast. And it's as far as they affect God's people that they are mentioned and in verse 9, the prophet says, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. Yeah, yes, it was these nations who came upon them, but it was because of their own faithlessness. There's warnings there for us. So let's come back to Daniel chapter 7 and have a bit of a closer look at these beasts. Here they are. The, three, uh, the four great beasts in verse 3 came up from the sea, diverse one from another. They were different kingdoms, weren't they? We were told that. Uh, over in verse 17, these great beasts which are four are four kingdoms or four kings. And so these are these kingdoms which come against Yahweh's people of Israel. The first one, verse 4, was like a lion, but it had eagle's wings. Then those wings were plucked and it was given a heart to man. So there were two parts to this animal. Uh, just hold your hand there in Daniel 7. Come over to Isaiah for a minute. Because in Isaiah chapter 5, we're given the first part of this dominion. This was a, a, a joint dominion of Assyria and Babylon. And together they formed the lion. The Assyrians were the swift army that came and uh, that took the northern tribes of Israel away captive in 722 BC. They came against Hezekiah's Jerusalem in BC 701. They were swift, mighty army, a cruel people. They would lop off the heads of their victims and stack the skulls up in pyramids outside the gates. They would, they would tear the flesh off their victims and hang them from the walls of their cities. They were a cruel, cruel people. And if we look in Isaiah chapter 5, we just pick up the record in verse 29, we read about Isaiah's record of the Assyrians coming so quickly. Uh, actually, let's just go back to verse 26. Yahweh's going to lift up, lift up an ensign, this, this banner for the nation to come from afar. They'll whistle one to them from the end of the earth, and behold, they'll come with speed swiftly. They're aligned with wings. Behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None of them shall be weary nor stumble among them. None of them shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. The chariots of the Assyrians who came roaring through the land. Verse 29, their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. They shall roar and lay hold of the prey. Here's the Assyrian aspect. 
but, but when we come over to Jeremiah, we see that there was also a second aspect of this line, the Babylonian. And if we come over to Jeremiah and to chapter 4, here we have Jeremiah's record of the Babylonian aspect. And the Babylonians weren't quite as cruel as the Assyrians. Uh, they weren't so much interested in lopping their enemies' heads off. They were rather interested in changing what was inside their enemies' heads. You think about what Nebuchadnezzar we did with Daniel in trying to change his perspective and change their thinking by changing their names, changing their diets, etc., etc. And so in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 7, Here's the Babylonian lion. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Here it is. Roaring out against the lion of Judah was the lion of Babylon. If you just come over one more quotation in Jeremiah chapter 50, we see the two put together, the two aspects of this lion kingdom. Here's the destroying wind that's going to come against Babylon and destroy it. But in verse 17 of this chapter 50 of Jeremiah, we see the mention of this uh, great um, dominion which comes against his people. Jeremiah 50 verse 17, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. He is the king with the lion with his wings. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones, the one with a man's heart who tried to change what was in man's heads. Well, of course, we shouldn't be surprised at this duality of this kingdom because it really started uh, right back in Genesis chapter 10. And we've got probably uh, the greatest exposition of Daniel uh, on our bookshelves in the form of Exposition of Daniel by Brother John Thomas. And he happens to write on page one of Ex Exposition of Daniel this comment. The kingdom of men was founded by Nimrod, son of Cush, who was son of Ham, son of Noah, quoting from Genesis 10, verses 8 to 12. This Nimrudia was the kingdom of men in the extent of it during the lifetime it's founding, comprehending, as we see, Babylon and Assyria. See, Nimrod went out, he established Assyria, and particularly the city of Nineveh, its capital, and then went south and established Babylon, Shinar. These were its roots and trunks, says Brother Thomas, which in after ages came to be famous for their strength and attitude, the beauty of their leaves, the abundance of their fruits, and their widespreading tops, so that all the nations had shadow under it, and their rulers and great men dwelt in the bowels, and all flesh were fed of it. Here was the commencement of that great kingdom of men, and it was in this kingdom of Babylon and Assyria. Well, let's move on. As we come now, we can see the logical progression. We've worked out the, what the line is. We know, therefore, that these subsequent dominions are the same as those that follow on the, as the head of gold in Daniel chapter 2. It's the same kingdoms. The bear, Persia, raised up on one side because the Persian element of the Medo-Persia empire was far more powerful. There was only one Medo king of the Medo-Persian emperor. Every other king was Persian. So the dominance was there of Persia. It had three ribs in its mouth because as it established its kingdom, it defeated uh, the kingdom of Lydia in the north, Babylon in the west, and Egypt in the south. And so those three dominions are seen in the bear's mouth, having taken control of it. It's a, it was arising to devour much flesh. The Persian army, of course, was all conquering for over 200 years. Uh, there are records of an army of some one million um, soldiers which marched forward against Greece, for example. 
Well, in verse 6, we have the third kingdom, don't we? We have Greece. Here was this swift army which was led by Alexander the, the, the Great who, who led blitzkrieg-like incursions into nations and took them so swiftly. Um, but on the back of it, it had four wings of the fowl and, uh, and four heads. And this, of course, describes how after Alexander the Great's death, there were four generals that stood up after him, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus and Ptolemy. And they established the kingdom of Greece. But the most interesting of the uh, beasts here in Daniel chapter 7, of course, is this fourth beast. Let's come to it now, and we're going to focus on this for the rest of our evening together. Verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, it had great iron teeth. There's the link. Back to the iron legs of Rome, isn't it? It devoured and break in pieces. It stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And so here's this great uh, power of Rome. And as we mentioned, it, it, it had both Western and Eastern um, components. If you just come over to verse 19 in the explanation of the beast... Uh, Daniel says there in verse 19, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were iron and his nails of brass. You see, here's the two halves. The iron being the western leg of Rome, the religious power, which we're going to see was seen in the papacy in the Catholic Church, and his nails of brass, that's the Greek power, which was in the east, eastern Rome, the eastern leg, which was in Constantinople. That was the military power. So you've got religious power and military power. Uh, what's interesting, of course, for our day is, of course, that this second Rome, which Constantinople was known as, which Constantine established, of course, um, you know, those years 312 to 324 AD, the power of the East actually shifted from Constantinople and moved up to the third Rome in Muscovy, which is, of course, today Moscow. And so Metropolitan Zosmia, in a forward to his work, a 1492 presentation of the Pascalian quite clearly expressed it, calling Ivan III the new Tsar Constantine of the new city of Constantine, Moscow. And in our days, the power of the religious West is still in Rome in the Catholic Church, but the power of the East, the military power, is seen in Russia. And we know that Russia is going to come down against Israel very soon. We're going to see it shortly. But as we come back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 8 presented something very interesting. We noted at the end of verse 7, we, we didn't read this, but at the end of verse 7, it says it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. It had 10 horns, and I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things." So here we have this unique little horn of the fourth beast. And what we see is it arises out of the fourth beast. In other words, it sprang out of pagan Rome. But it came after the ten horns. And these ten horns were ten barbarian kings. In fact, if you want to make a, a reference to Revelation, Revelation 17, verse 12 to 14, talks about these ten kings. Uh, these are the ten main barbarian tribes that took control of the Western Roman Empire um, in the 400 ADs. And there were mainly ten uh, around that time. The, the, the groups tended to chop and change a little bit, but essentially you had the Anglo-Saxons, the Suavi, the Franks, um, the Altamani, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Barganians, the Visigoths, the Vandals and the Heruli. And these were the ten uh, main tribes that controlled the area. But then one little horn pushes up and uproots three of these horns. And what happened was that there was a power that sprang up 
after three of these horns were overcome, and the three horns were overcome were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, all who had control in Italy. And what replaced their power was this little horn. Well, what is it? Well, it had eyes like a man. It's a system led by a man that sees everything. You may have heard the, the, the Catholic Church talk about the Pope as the Holy See. Here's this great authority held by this system which sees all things and is ruled by fear for hundreds and hundreds of years until recent times when it now rules by deception. We're going to come back to that at the end of our talk. And not only that, but it's got a mouth. You see, it has a mouth that speaks great things. You may have heard, of course, of the Pope as being able to speak ex cathedra. This concept of what comes out of the mouth of the Pope is infallible because it comes from God. And, of course, the Pope claims this divinity. Uh, keep your hand in Daniel 7. Come over to Second Thessalonians because, of course, Paul explains this falling away that was going to come. And this falling away that was going to lead to the papacy was actually springing out of the ecclesia itself, tragically. If we have a look in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, we can see Paul's explanations to the Thessalonians who believed that Jesus was going to return in their own lifetimes. And, and Paul had to tell them that that wasn't the case. And in verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says to them, Let no man deceive you. You see, this great power is a power of deception. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Some of you probably have got noted there that the Greek word there for falling away first is actually the word whereby we get the English word apostasy. This is an apostasy, which literally means a defection from the truth. Here's a group, a, a power that defects from truth and sets up their own deception as what is true. And that man of sin will be revealed the son of perdition. Who is this man of sin, Paul? Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, this is the man. Headed up, that papacy, the Catholic Church, the Pope. 4 verse 7, the mystery of iniquity does already work. The seedbed of the Catholic Church was seen in Judaism. Just go back to Zechariah chapter 5 in your own leisure. Have a look at how that woman in the ephah was lifted up from Jerusalem and shifted to Babylon and became that harlot system of Babylon the Great. The Catholic system sprang out of Judaism, which was forming through the ecclesia of God. It was already working in Paul's day. He was warning the disciples about these deceptive teachings which, which were coming from these Judaizers. Only, he says in verse 7, he who now letteth, that's, that's the word we get in tennis, a let, it actually means to hinder. It's when the ball hits the net and it's hindered. So, so, so there was something hindering the formation of, the, uh, of this man of sin, the mystery of iniquity, and, and that was the pagan um, system of Rome itself. And pagan Rome was going to be taken out of the way, the end of verse 7 says, and then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What is the focus of this system? Verse 10, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause shall God send them a strong delusion that they shall believe a lie, a deception, that they all might be condemned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This system is all about trying to fool us. Pull the wool over our eyes. 
That's the system of this papacy headed up by the Pope over the Catholic Church. And we come back to Daniel chapter 7 and we see in verses 21 and 25 that it makes war against the saints. This was the inquisition of the Catholic Church against the true believers. You may have heard of the Spanish Inquisition where there, was, there were people who didn't necessarily have the truth but who stood up against the Catholics who went through horrible persecution, torture, imprisonment and death. And of course, there were faithful brothers and sisters down through that time. Uh, some of the work of Brother Alan Eyre has touched on some of those uh, groups. Well, in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 7, this system changes times and laws. Uh, and the Catholic Church did that. It changed our calendar to the Gregorian calendar. It, it has its traditions and its special days, just like the Jews had under the law. Catholicism sprang out of Judaism, this focus on salvation by works. And in verse 25, he has an ascendancy for a specific period of time. Let's have a look at it. Verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. So the papacy had a set period of time and power. What is it? Well, very simply, a time is 360 days. That's how many days the Jews have in a year. So one time is 360 days or day years. Two times is double that, 720 days. Half of that, of course, half of the time is half of 360, 180 days. If we add that together, 1260 days or 42 months. The papacy was to have dominion for a set period of time. It was going to end. What a wonderful Wonderful prophecy that was for the people, the believers in particular, who lived through the dark ages of that papacy. The ones who were being tortured, the ones who were being put to death, they were being told through the prophet, don't give up, keep believing, hold on to your faith, don't renounce the Lord Jesus Christ, because the papacy is going to come to an end. And that time is repeated through Daniel and Revelation on a number of occasions. Daniel 7 verse 25 we've read. Daniel 12 verse 7, a time, times and a half. Revelation 12 verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness. Here's uh, this um, group of saints, those who were called out, not believers, but uh, people who were set apart by God for withstanding the Catholic Church for 1,203 score days, 1,260 days. Verse 14, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. See the parallel between verse 6 and verse 14 of Revelation chapter 12. It's the same time period. Revelation 13 verse 5, power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. It's the same time period, but it was going to come to an end. And what a remarkable fulfillment we see in history of that prophecy. The rise and fall of the papacy took place over a moving period of 1260 years. It began in 533 when Justinian acknowledged the Pope of the Universal Bishop of the, of the Church and that growth finished in BC 610 when Focus confirmed Justinian's decree. And if we move on 1260 years from each of those key events, we see the end and the decline of that papacy. So 1260 years after BC uh, AD 533, we come to 1793, which was the commencement of the French Revolution, the beginning of the reign of, of terror when the papal power was going to be broken. It moves through the Napoleonic Wars, 
where he annexes the papal states, where the Pope Pius IX was driven in exile and then the French signaled the intent to abandon the papacy. And it ended with the temporal power of the Pope on the 20th December 1870, exactly 1260 years after Focus confirmed Justinian's decree in BC 610. What an amazing fulfilment of Bible prophecy. Yes, it was going to rise, but it was going to fall. And so what we see is a great flow through from Daniel into Revelation. And we're not going to look at all the beasts of Revelation. That would be another class entirely. But just look at these little comparisons. Uh, this beast in chapter 7 of Daniel comes out of the sea. So did the beast in chapter 13, verse 1 of Revelation. It had seven heads. Each of those beasts in Revelation 12, 13 and 17 had seven heads, ten horns. It spoke great things, blasphemy, as the beast in chapter, th uh, chapter 17 persecutes the saints in each of those Revelation chapters. Rules for 1260 days, we've seen that. And it's judged at the time of the kingdom in Revelation 17. The saints assist with that judgment and the beast is destroyed by fire. And that consistent message has been in Christadelphian teaching since 1848. That's our heritage. Our pioneer brethren, particularly Brother Thomas, Brother Roberts, Brother Walkers and others, all proclaim this consistent message. Nothing has changed because it's the message of the Bible. And if we just come over to Revelation chapter 17, I want to show you what this beast becomes. You see, it was a horn, a symbol of power and control, of having dominion, of being ruthless and aggressive. But over time, that changed and it morphed into a different animal, a different beast altogether. And let's have a look at it in Revelation chapter 17. Here's what it's become. Verse 1 of Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. That's what it's become. It's become a, become a corrupting harlot, which is going, trying to take away the minds of people away from God. It's a harlot. Sitting on many warnings, having control over the nations. With whom, verse 2, the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And so the spirit carried him away and he saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication and upon her head was the name written mystery Babylon the Great, there's where the kingdom of men started, right back at the time of Nimrod. It started with Babylon and it finishes with Babylon. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And when John saw it at the end of verse 6, how she was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished, the Greek means. He was absolutely horrified at this abomination. How do you feel when you think about that system which is still in the earth today? A system which is trying to corrupt people's minds. We'll come back to Daniel chapter 7 because this is what God thinks of it. You remember that great stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands in Daniel chapter 2 and it struck the image on its feet and crushed the whole image together because the image empire stood up with the united uniting of, of Catholic Europe and the Russian military power. Well, that's the same image of this beast that's being ridden by this harlot being destroyed. Have a look in verse 11. Or well, verse 9, the Ancient of Days did sit. Here's God giving power to the Son, the Son of Man, verse 13. But what does he do? He issues out the saints who bring judgment 
And in verse 11, the result of this judgment is this. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. That's exactly what happened in that image in Daniel 2. And it's destroyed here. And it's the work of the Father through the Son with the saints. But what we're going to see is that that great power of the papacy, what we've seen already, is that it's no longer now a great power of aggression and of military might, of aggressive ruthlessness, but no, it is now a prostitute. He sold herself for the nation. And this is the great warning. The deception of this system that Paul spoke about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And it all started right back in the garden. When a serpent, yes, that's right, that beast in Revelation chapter 12 is called the old serpent, isn't it? That serpent in the garden that represented the lie. And that is what this system has perpetrated for the last 2,000 years. A lie. You won't surely die. Well, that's what they've proclaimed, haven't they? Your soul is going to go to heaven. You, you don't actually die at all. Your soul lives in perpetuity. It's the old lie. You won't really have to believe in God or obey him. Not really. And all you have to do, I've only just listed a few of them there, there's 20 there, of all the changes that the Catholic Church brought into their worship that are not in the Bible. And they've added this new way of worship because you don't really have to believe God or do what he says. Do what the church says. A couple billion people can't be wrong, can they? Well, you can save yourself through your own efforts. That was the message of the serpent, isn't it? No, no, you won't die if you eat the fruit. You'll become like the angels. You can save yourself. You've got the power to do it. You don't need God. And through a few Hail Marys, a few Our Fathers, it doesn't really matter what you do during the week. You can have it all resolved on Sunday and it's all good. You can save yourself through your own efforts. You are complete in yourself without God. And that message, which was perpetrated through the Catholic Church, has become the basis of our modern democratic society. That's what we're being told. Everywhere we look, everything we read, everything we see outside of in the world around. We're being told, you're a good person to yourself, so accept who you are. Let no one else tell you what to do. You have the answers in yourself. Not only be tolerant, but be accepting of all other beliefs and practices, as long as they don't hurt anyone else. It sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds fine. Love yourself exactly as you are right now. Oh, fantastic. Let's pin it on our fringes. But it's a lie. Because God says, you are naturally like the sparks that fly upward and dissipate and disappear. Naturally, you have no hope. Naturally, you are sinners in Adam. So turn to me. Because I can save you in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a lie. This message of the world. Love yourself for who you are. Change yourself for what you want because you love yourself. It's a lie. Don't be fooled. What does God want of you? How does he want you to live? That understanding comes from the scriptures. And so think about that. And don't be caught up in all the other things of this modern age with this modern Christian music and its teachings and conduct and attitude 
towards all sorts of abominations which God hates. Don't be fooled. I just want you quickly to come to Proverbs chapter 7 because this is how God sees this woman. And in Proverbs 7, we've got this warning to bind God's word in our heart, to think about it that we might be kept from the strange woman. Let's have a look in verse 4. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep them from the strange woman. The NIV says the adulterous woman. Here's the harlot sister. From the stranger which flattereth with her words. The NIV says the wayward woman with her seductive words. Oh, it's a seductive message, all right. Sounds good. Makes you feel good about yourself. But Proverbs chapter 7 goes on to describe her in verse 11 as being loud. This religious corruption in verse 14. Being this wealthy woman in verse 16. Persuasive in verse 21. And free from all constraints of her master in verses 19 to 20. But what's her end? Verse 27. Her house is the way to hell, Sheol, the grave going down to the chambers of death. That's the end result. The wide road that leads to destruction. Don't walk on that way, young people. No, verse 24, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children. Listen to the Father. Attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. Don't err. Don't be corrupted by that way of thinking. Flee from her influence. Don't get caught up with her daughters. No, come out of her. And that's the great call of Revelation 18, isn't it? Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people. I just want to finish in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 because this is what we've been called to, to leave behind that corrupt way of thinking whereby anything goes. And as long as it feels good and it suits us, then that's good enough. It's not good enough, young people. God wants us to live righteously before him. Yes, he does the saving. There's no doubt about that. We are saved through his grace and mercy. But in appreciation of that, the Father expects us to live the way that he wants us to live. He has set certain criteria and boundaries by which we are bound. And we should delight in his law as the Lord Jesus Christ did. And so the Apostle Paul in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 6 says this, doesn't he? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What symphony, as the word means, hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are a temple of living God. As God has said, I will dwell within them and walks about in them, the Greek means. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Don't be fooled by the harlot system, young people. All that it's selling is lies emptiness and vanity and it will result in your death. But you turn to the Father. Separate yourselves from the things of this life. Separate yourself to him. Touch not the unclean thing and he will receive you in Christ Jesus. Believe and be baptised and live according to his righteousness. He will be a father unto you and will be his children. And when he sends his son back to the earth, as he soon will, to destroy that pagan system... We'll be with him. Who will be on the Lord's side? We can make that decision now.